Do you see my slides? Excellent. Yes, yes we can yes. see your slides. <laughs> so, um, as in the previous sessions, uh, let me very quickly say, uh, so first of all, let me mute all of you. Um, let me very quickly say the format. The format is uh, each speaker gets 25 minutes uh, clean. So uh, all of you will remain muted. Uh, feel free to ask questions through chat. Um, but, um, but we encourage questions to be relegated to the parallel session. Um, uh, feel free to keep your cameras on. That usually makes it for a much better wholesome experience. And uh, uh, I will remind after 20, 20 minutes, I will, I will give a five minute warning. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Nastya, would you like to introduce our first speaker? Yeah, sure. It is my uh, pleasure to introduce the first talk of today by Maureen Fontan, uh, who will talk about real forms of complexified Hamiltonian systems. And her colleague, Philip Arathon, will join her uh, in the parallel session later on today. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for organizing the, this conference. It's um, very well organized. Uh, I'm going to presentation, so it's going to do the parallel session. And let's me, let me a bit explain uh, what we would like to do with it in the title. Um, so we don't really complexify a uh, manifold in this, in this talk. We will go the other way. But if you start with, for example, a real Hamiltonian system, let's say just R2, and you take a Hamiltonian function, which is like just say polynomial, then it's easy to complexify everything. So you go on C2, you have a holomorphic symplectic form, and your Hamiltonian, uh, you take all the complex variables, it becomes complex, and you get a holomorphic Hamiltonian system. And what we wanted to demonstrate in that work is that uh, from a holomorphic system, which is a rigid one, you can obtain different uh, real forms, like different real Hamiltonian system, um, that are all like sort of the same, uh, they're all related by this holomorphic system. So let's try, oh, I cannot change my slide. Ah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, uh, so I will start with this example. You, 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 you are on C2 and you take complex variables and you have a holomorphic symplectic form. Now you take just a random Hamiltonian like complex and we would like to obtain a dynamical system on a real form. So a real form is a totally real submanifold, which of half dimension. So with C2, it will be a copy of R2. Uh, but now there are several copies of R2 in C2. And we would like one on which the Hamiltonian is real. Uh, you can have different one. Like one example is you just said the imaginary parts to be zero. And then the real form is R2. The homomorphic symplectic form restrict to a nice canonical real symplectic form. Or you can take another, another copy of R2 and you also have the restriction, which is a real symplectic form. Um, now what happened with the Hamiltonian? Uh, I, I just, okay. So when you restrict this Hamiltonian to both real forms, you obtain a real function. So altogether, you obtain two real Hamiltonian system. And if you have the Hamiltonian, you can get the Hamiltonian vector fields and in that case, because it's two dimensional, uh, the flow lines, if you forget about parametrization, um, the flow lines are just a level set. So you already observed that you have different uh, dynamical system on different real form. And this is what we would like to show in that talk, but we would like to be a bit more general about it. Like uh, we will take a holomorphic symplectic manifold that we fix and we try to obtain like, have like a theory that tells you how to obtain a real dynamical system on a symplectic real form. So as I said, we are not really uh, doing complexification of the object. We already suppose that we have a homomorphic uh, manifold which is fixed and we try uh, to obtain real system out of it. So there are two parts of that work, like one, one part has to do with dynamics. So 
homomorphic Hamilton system, how do you get real one? And what happens if you have an integrable system? And on the other hand, there's also a geometric part which shows you how you can define uh, real forms like for Poisson geometry, what happens if you have a group action on it and you want to know how, how, how does the whole thing behave under Poisson reduction? And uh, so Phil is gonna uh, talk about that part and I'm gonna focus on the dynamic part. And there's also uh, um, a part of the world that has to do with hyperkeller geometry. And this is actually used, you will see, uh, to find an example that we will call a compact real form for the spherical pendulum. So the spherical pendulum is a real Hamiltonian system, which is defined of a cotangent bundle of the sphere. And in fact, we will see that S2 cross S2 can be seen as uh, another uh, real form of the same homomorphic uh, system. And we will see what the spherical pendulum is on, on that form. So the first definition is what is a real form? So you take a, a homomorphic symplectic manifold and it has a complex structure I. Uh, because the form is homomorphic, you can write it into its uh, real and imaginary part. And then you can check that as a real manifold, M is uh, symplectic with respect to both. And uh, those two are not arbitrary, they are related uh, through the Cauchy Riemann equation. So a real form of a complex manifold is um, a totally real submanifold, which has has dimension. So it means that you can split the tangent space in that way at each x. And so this is just a real form. Now, if you want this real form to be uh, uh, symplectic, uh, we will call it real symplectic if when you restrict your homomorphic form to it, uh, this is purely real. And on the other hand, you can also define an imaginary symplectic form. Uh, when you restrict the homomorphic form to it, you get uh, something purely imaginary. You can treat like both in the same way. I will uh, mainly talk about the, the first one, but everything works really similarly if you take imaginary symplectic form. So if you take one such real symplectic form of M, then it is a Lagrangian submanifold of M uh, with respect to the imaginary symplectic form. And as a consequence, so because if it's purely real, it means that uh, omega i will be zero on, on n, and n is of half dimension, so it's Lagrangian. And if you have this, you can check that uh, the real part restricted to n is uh, non-degenerate as a consequence of uh, the cauchy riemann equation. Um, now, uh, real forms can be obtained as fixed point set of real structure. So a real structure is a anti-holomorphic involution on m, so it's square to identity and uh, it anti-commute with a complex structure. And in that case, a fixed point set is a real, uh, a real form. And if now you want, you have a symplectic structure on M, uh, then you, you, you can ask your involution to satisfy this uh, to be a symplectic, anti uh, conjugate symplectic. Uh, so it's symplectic with respect to real part and uh, anti-symplectic with respect to the imaginary part. And same thing for the imaginary uh, symplectic structure. And in that case, uh, the fixed point set are real symplectic and imaginary symplectic uh, form, respectively. And let me show you some example. So the complex sphere, uh, it's same as in as the real sphere. Uh, you just take complex variables instead of real. And this is a complex, uh, uh, it is a complex manifold and it has a holomorphic symplectic form, big omega. And on it, you take like three, the three involution that are uh, anti, anti holomorphic, and you take the fixed point set, you will get uh, the sphere, the two sheeted hyperboloid and the one sheeted hyperboloid. And in fact, uh, this uh, sphere will be a real symplectic form and as well the two sheeted hyperboloid. And this one is imaginary symplectic. And Phil, Phil will explain this it's in this talk that in fact, those involution um, come from uh, Lie algebra involution. 
because CS2 is also a quadrant orbit of SL2C. And on SL2C, you, you have a group involution. And, and one of them is the fixed point sets. Uh, one of the fixed point sets is a compact ring form, which is SU2. And this is why here you get a sphere, which is also a quadrant orbit of SU2. And here you will get uh, SU11 one, one, and here uh, SL2R. Uh, Another example, uh, if we want to, to talk about dynamics, uh, these are cotangent bundles. So the cotangent bundle of a complex manifold is also a complex manifold. It's symplectic with canonical symplectic form. And if you take a, a real structure on C, so you can lift it on the cotangent bundle uh, such that uh, the, 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 the it becomes a real symplectic structure. So the lift is defined like in a real way, but uh, it has to be anti-holomorphic. So, so you take the conjugate here and you can choose signs. And depending which sign you choose, uh, the fixed point set that I wrote here uh, is a real symplectic form of the cotangent bundle. And you can identify it with the cotangent bundle of the fixed point set of little r. So this is a way to obtain uh, real phase spaces in complex phase spaces. So we are interested, how does that behave uh, with respect to dynamics? If you take a Hamiltonian, which is holomorphic, it, there's no surprise. It works the same way as in the real case, you can define a holomorphic uh, Hamiltonian vector field. And oh yeah. <clears throat> and how can we, uh, what will we talk, uh, well, um, what would we call a real form of a holomorphic Hamiltonian system? Well, uh, for, for the phase space, you will take a symplectic real form, uh, N, and the restriction is purely real. And for the dynamics, you would like the flow of this holomorphic Hamiltonian vector field to leave that real form N invariant. So, <clears throat> so on the real form, uh, the flow, it, it means that uh, the flow of the Hamiltonian vector field is the same as the flow generated by its real part, only on that real form. And it's a reasonable assumption to, to have. And uh, we can show that this happened if only if the imaginary part of the Hamiltonian is locally constant on, on N. So in particular, the Hamiltonian doesn't have to be uh, purely real. And so uh, the real form will be uh, this symplectic real form and the restriction of uh, uh, the, 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 the real part of the Hamiltonian to, to N. Uh, as an example, you can take the complex two sphere and it has a cotangent bundle. And you take the real structure we've seen uh, before and the fixed point sets are uh, here uh, gives uh, the sphere and the two sheeted hyperboloid. And if you want real structure on the cotangent bundle, you leave them with a plus sign uh, so that you get uh, as fixed point set uh, the real cotangent bundle on the sphere and well, just one sheet of the hyperboloids and both of them are symplectic real form. Uh, and now if you take just the free Hamiltonian, uh, then it, it becomes purely real uh, on, on both. So in particular, the, the flow of the vector field will leave those two real forms uh, invariant. There, actually, there's nothing special about uh, this uh, free Hamiltonian. You could take the many Hamiltonian in general that satisfy this, like that are real on those two real forms. So you can somehow relate dynamics on spheres and hyperboloids um, in that way. And what happens if we now suppose that we are working with integrable system? So how do we define a holomorphic integrable system? Well, exactly, we define it the same way as for a real system. Uh, it's a collection of an holomorphic function <clears throat> on, 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 on M uh, that Poisson commute for the holomorphic Poisson bracket and uh, which are like, whose differential are linearly independent 
uh, almost everywhere on, 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 on M. Uh, in the real case, uh, a real integral system is exactly the same. You just replace the Fi will be like smooth function. Uh, here it will be Rn. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so, and when you have a holomorphic uh, system, usually we think of F1 as being uh, the Hamiltonian H and the other Fi's are the integrals. So these are like quantities that are constant uh, along uh, the motion of, of F. So sometimes we call F1 the Hamiltonian and the, the, the other one are like first integrals of, of H. And how could, can we define a, a real form for a holomorphic integrable system? Well, you can expect that you would say as before that the Hamiltonian, the first one, uh, will leave some symplectic real form invariant, but it will be maybe a too strong assumption to ask that all the other integrals preserve that real form. So it's quite of reasonable to ask just F1 leaves uh, a, a real form invariant. And that, that, that's what we have here, that you have a holomorphic symplectic manifold, you take a real phase space in it or so real form symplectic and H leaves it invariant then you can say that uh, the restriction of H to N is uh, real, um, or at least at imaginary part is constant, uh, is a completely integrable system, which means that it has additional integrals of motion, which are in involution and independent uh, almost everywhere. So how does that work? Um, well, if you have, you take uh, all, um, the, uh, the real parts and the imaginary parts of the Fi, and you, so the real function on M, you, you restrict them to the real form, and all together with the Poisson bracket, the real Poisson bracket, they generate a, an algebra, which is called uh, closed under that bracket. And you can show that this algebra uh, is actually uh, complete. So Complete, it means that uh, if you take any function in that algebra, uh, you take the Hamiltonian vector field, uh, all of them will generate a subspace at, at some point, uh, you evaluate it at some point, they will generate a subspace of Tn, and you take a point such that this, uh, this subspace is of maximal dimension, <clears throat> and if this system, if this is uh, co-isotropic, then uh, the algebra is called uh, complete. And it was shown that by uh, Bolsinov and Jovanovic that uh, if, if, if this complete algebra is an, moreover an algebra of first integral of H, uh, then the system is completely integrable. So when, when F, so here we just have a complete algebra we show that it's a complete algebra. But if you suppose that H leaves a real form invariant, it means that uh, all the other uh, imaginary part and real parts, because they commute, uh, because the, the, the Poisson commute, they are all constant uh, along the flow of H. So in particular, the algebra that you get in that case um, is an algebra of first integral. So that gives you complete integrability. Uh, on the other hand, we can also uh, say we start with a real symplectic form and we have a real Hamiltonian system on it, uh, all of, or, um, with analytic integrals. So if you have analytic integrals, you can uh, take the holomorphic extension in your neighborhood of the real form. Um, and this uh, also define um, a holomorphic uh, integrable system. And so that's a bit the idea we wanted to, to, to illustrate uh, that if you start with a homomorphic symplectic manifold and you take two different real form, then suppose that on a system, you have a real integrable system. Uh, you have a real integrable system with analytic integral. 
then you can you can extend it to a holomorphic system, at least in a neighborhood of the real form in, in, in N. And if this other real form is also included in that neighborhood, uh, then you can obtain, uh, you can construct uh, another integrable system on, on this real form. And that's what we wanted to do with um, a classical example of integrable system. Uh, the spherical pendulum on the cotangent bundle of spheres. So you have uh, H has um, kinetic energy here and linear potential. And it has a, it is uh, invariant by uh, S1 rotation. So you have an additional integral, which is angular momentum. And G, G and H are Poisson commute and uh, they are linearly independent almost everywhere. So you have an integrable system. And the image uh, is called the bifurcation diagram, which is drawn here in the GH plane. Uh, the boundary here are the, the image, or are the image of the rank one critical point, so the relative equilibria in that case. And the dots here are uh, the image of the rank zero uh, critical point. So, We start with now uh, the complex manifold. You take a product of two complex here. Uh, Marine, uh, it's a five minute warning. Yeah, it's finished almost. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so here, if we start with a, um, a homomorphic manifold, which is a product of two complex sphere, uh, both of them have simpl a homomorphic symplectic form. And there's one uh, real form, which is quite straightforward. It's like a product of two real sphere with the restriction of the homomorphic form is uh, the, the, the symplectic form on this product, the standard one. And this is a real, uh, this is a real symplectic form. But there's another one, which is, which appears to be a cotangent bundle of S2 with canonical symplectic form. And this real form is actually imaginary symplectic. And this is where the whole hyperkeller geometry uh, is coming into play. And that's, that's why Phil is gonna talk about uh, later. So we can take this spherical pendulum on this imaginary real form. We can uh, complexify it to get a holomorphic system on this complex manifold. And we take it, uh, we push it back on uh, this other real form. And it turns out that the, the Hamiltonian is purely real. So you have a, a new real integrable system on S2 cross S2. And so what is this system? So I'll give you the, the Hamiltonian. What you see this part, comes from the kinetic energy of the spherical pendulum. And this is what the potential is becoming. And the additional integral, it's uh, the, on TS2, it was like given by the, 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 the SO2 rotation, uh, also becomes an SO2 rotation on, on, on the product of two spheres. And the image of this, the bifurcation diagram of this integrable system is a, looks like a teardrop. And it has like a four rank uh, zero critical uh, values. And this is because when you, this system has only uh, two uh, rank zero um, critical points. But when you complexify, when you have a complex Hamiltonian system, this one also has uh, singularities. And actually it has four. And when you take a, these four critical points, descend on that real form, but they, they do not go on, the, on, on, on this real form. No, only two of them belongs to the T star S2 real form. So, this, we, we, we can think about uh, this system on S2 cross S2 as being a compact real form of the spherical pendulum, a bit in the same way 
that we will talk about um, compact drill form for for Lee group and yeah so that's the end I think I will stop here that's time thank you okay. Okay, thank you very much, Maureen, for this wonderful talk. So let's all give uh, a round of applause to Maureen, uh, including emojis. Let's all give an emoji a round of applause to Maureen. Thank you very much. Okay, then uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's, uh, let's uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, Matteo, Matteo, where are you? Yeah, here you are. So Matteo, I'm going to make you uh, a co-host so that you will be able to share your screen. And I'm also going to unmute you. Unmute you. Okay. Does it work fine? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Good. Just perfect. Okay, so uh, let's wait uh, just a couple of minutes uh, in case someone wants to tune in for your talk uh, specifically, um, just that uh, until half past. So until then, uh, let me just mention that, uh, so <clears throat> those of you uh, who are joining us for the first time, again, the format is that we have 25 minute talks um, and this will go on for two hours. Uh, so there will be three more uh, 25 minute talks. And after that, we will have one hour of parallel sessions. So all the four, speakers from this morning session will, will split into four simultaneous rooms and uh, you uh, can feel free to circulate uh, between those rooms to ask questions or listen to the second part of the talk all that all that information and rooms and all the links are all in the uh, in the conference package um, right okay so I we still have a couple of minutes so uh, the other thing that I want to mention is that after the parallel session. Uh, so there'll be a short uh, kind of screen free break. Uh, but after that, we have uh, social time, which we encourage everyone to attend. Uh, one one uh, item on the uh, social activities list in particular that I want to advertise, that advertise is Mario Kart. Believe it or not, we'll have a Mario Kart uh, social activity. The only thing is uh, uh, I mentioned it yesterday, I want to mention it again, it, it, uh, it requires a little bit of preparation. So the conference package explains exactly exactly what you need to do and what you need to download. But once you download the app, which is free, uh, you need to complete the first Mario Kart in order to unlock the multiplayer. So just make sure you, you do that. Um, okay, that's all I wanted to say. So. Okay. I think I can already introduce Matteo, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm happy to introduce our second speaker of today, uh, Matteo Cassati from University of Kent, who will talk about Poisson and quasi-Poisson structures for non-abelian integrable systems. Uh, hello, thank you, Anastasia, and thank you for, uh, to the organizer for, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak at this workshop, uh, since uh, I'm usually from outside Strict, uh, the Poisson community, strictly speaking, since I'm coming from the integrable systems one. And uh, what I'm going to do today is, in fact, trying to, uh, to, to tell you uh, what, uh, what are the results of some, uh, of some research work that I've been doing recently about using uh, uh, ideas from uh, Poisson geometry or from, I mean, uh, even kind of from the basic of Poisson geometry uh, to describe uh, uh, non-abelian integrable systems. And uh, to do so, I, I will start with something that everyone knows, which is a kind of a, a super, a super short introduction of Poisson bracket, because uh, uh, that's the main object uh, I'm interested in. Uh, and, and you'll see, you'll see why, you'll see how. So, uh, okay, we know the story of Poisson brackets. Uh, a couple of Poisson conferences ago, there was uh, an exhibit and a book by Yvette Kreshmar-Schwarz like about Poisson co uh, contribution, uh, to, to, of course, to the field, kind of a seminal contribution. And uh, this is what, uh, I mean, on this slide, you can see how the uh, original Poisson brackets were born. Uh, there is uh, the formula by Poisson and the Jacobi identity by Jacobi, even if this form is not really by Jacobi, but is by a 
I mean, by a Russian mathematician whose name, unfortunately, I have completely forgotten in this name. It was kind of a student who attended Jacobi lectures and provided the Jacobi identity in kind of in a readable form. Uh, but I mean, that's what we know. Uh, and that's what we are all taught uh, kind of in basic ge differential geometry or Poisson geometry course. So what is a Poisson bracket? Well, uh, we have a Poisson algebra, uh, which is a triple of an associative algebra and the Lie algebra with the Leibniz property, basically. And that's what, uh, uh, that, that's what we are always told. Uh, kind of the slogan for this is that a Poisson bracket is a Lie bracket, which is also a derivation of, uh, of an associative algebra. And uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of a very basic idea, of course. And uh, for integral system or for dynamical system in general, what we really are interested about, what we really need for a Poisson bracket is uh, the fact that we have uh, a, a mechanical, a physical, or kind of an abstract system, which is a space, what can be called like a phase space normally, or it's a field space if you're thinking about some kind of field theory, uh, P, and uh, we have a way to extract information from the system, which are observables, kind of in the basic, uh, in the basic settings, there are smooth function on the phase space. And uh, over these uh, two sets, uh, which uh, are, uh, well, are of course related, but they are not the same, uh, we have a Lie algebra for the observables, and an action of the observables on the space by derivation. The first one, of course, is the, our Poisson bracket. The second one is Hamiltonian, our Hamiltonian vector fields. And of course, the two are not unrelated and we have the usual uh, very well-known uh, anti-isomorphism between uh, uh, Poisson uh, brackets and commutator vector fields on the space. Uh, what, this is what I would like to stress at the beginning. This is my introduction because uh, when uh, we move away from uh, classical finite dimensional systems and we go to either infinite dimensional system like systems of PDEs or system of differential difference equations or uh, in another way to non-abelian systems, then uh, these two rows for one bracket are kind of get disconnected and we must find a way to, to, to save both of them in the space we are, we are, we are working with. And, uh, this is uh, uh, a very, I mean, I will never, won't ever have time to discuss all of this, of course. This is, uh, uh, I mean, there, these are very three simple kind of examples of how we uh, use uh, Poisson Brexit integral system. I think that to enter in the mindset, the most useful and still standard one is the use of uh, Hamiltonian formalism for. Uh, uh, Hamiltonian formalism for uh, PDEs and that which is kind of very well known and since uh, at least in the integral system community since the, since the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, this is, uh, well, we are interested in functions of, let's say two variables, uh, a space uh, X uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the time parameter. And uh, this equation uh, and this function obey a question of motions uh, of evolutionary time. So there is the partial derivative of a function with respect to time is some expression that depends on the function and on its uh, derivatives. Possibly, I mean, uh, on time itself, but uh, I mean, I'm kind of going to get the easy way around here and I will forget about explicit dependence on the time. Uh, we have a space of fields that uh, we make as a formal, uh, as a formal counterpart of the space with these uh, uh, functions u of x leaf. And the space of fields uh, is modeled by uh, differential polynomials or functions. Uh, of course, differential function are an extension of differential polynomials, so I will kind of keep it easy. Uh, namely, uh, we will have these, uh, these, these objects, which are uh, polynomials in the jet variables, so in variables that count the formal derivatives of use, and uh, smooth functions in uh, the uh, generator, I mean, in the function u itself. Of course, here we, we forget that u and the derivatives of u are actual functions themselves, so we just use them, regard them as symbols. And uh, out of these uh, densities of local function, out of these uh, differential function, uh, we construct the space of local functionals. Uh, if someone has a background like more analytical, they normally here they start to screech because I'm integrating without giving details about what I mean by integrating, but this is an idea that actually comes back to, I guess, Gelfand and, uh, and Dickey, uh, for which uh, the formal space of local functional is a quotient space by the densities of local functional modulo uh, the images of uh, total derivatives. 
The idea here but in the background is that if you have uh, functions that vanish, uh, the boundary vanish at infinity on the space, then you can integrate by part without taking into account boundary values. Or if you are working as many of the early people here with the periodic function, you don't have boundary terms and then uh, your integral operation is, uh, I mean, allows you to integrate, I mean, your integration by parts is uh, uh, what characterizes your, your space of local functionals, and uh, this is uh, uh, the space where you where, where you can integrate by parts. Uh, the prototypical example of Hamiltonian PDE uh, is KDV, Corporate Degree Equation. Of course, this is, uh, as kind of everyone knows, integrable. It is nonlinear equation. There is this nonlinear term, which is kind of a hop for business term, and a dispersive term with the derivatives of the function. And this uh, and this equation is well, by, but Hamiltonian, in the sense that you can write the equation of motion, think to it a little bit like your Hamiltonian vector field, as uh, an operator, P1, well, by Hamiltonian means that you can do it in two different ways, of course, uh, an operator applied to the variational derivative of a local function. Uh, this is uh, the same, I mean, the same idea that when you do in classical mechanics, Hamiltonian vector fields, you applied your uh, Poisson, uh, Poisson by vector to the gradient of your uh, Hamiltonian functions. And well, this is uh, how it is for, uh, for, for KDV. Uh, the idea is that, of course, that uh, uh, by Hamiltonian, that's what I wrote before, means that this, uh, not only this, um, this equation of motion can be written in two different ways, but the Poisson bracket between uh, these Hamiltonians, according to either or to both of the uh, Poisson bracket defined by the operator, by this kind of formula, uh, are, are in evolution. And this bracket here on the space of local functional, this is something that I, I like to stress, is a Lie algebra bracket. Uh, but cannot be a derivation of the space of local functional because the space of local function is not an algebra. There is not a well-defined product on it. And yet defines uh, uh, an action of the local functionals on the space of local densities by derivations, basically defines uh, the equation of motion by the formula I showed before. And uh, as usual, I mean, that's what kind of tells us that uh, we are working with uh, uh, with our usual, in a sense, uh, post sombrek story is that there is still uh, this is more in between uh, uh, the Lie algebra of observables and uh, the algebra of uh, vector fields or evolutionary vector fields uh, generated by, by them. So now this was kind of an introduction and I, I mean, I, uh, I apologize with uh, people who, who know it, which so that uh, was super trivial and for people who don't, who maybe may think that a bit too quick. Uh, because we would like to kind of to get to our main uh, to, to, to our main main course today, which is non-abelian systems of equation. Uh, okay, these systems uh, is kind of our let, let's take it as for typical example system. This is a system of ODEs for a function u and v function of time, and uh, this is a system that I'd like to to present to you. It's uh, u dot is a u square v minus v u square and v dot equals zero. And the first time I normally show this, uh, someone in the audience raised their hand and say, oh, this system is trivial. Of course, it's zero and zero. But it's in fact not, because now we take UMV to be element of GLN, so matrices. And of course, the product of matrices is not commutative. So this uh, system is not trivial. And uh, despite it may look like a, a weird construction, this is in fact a, at least a couple of interesting and remarkable applications because if your U is not in GLN but in SON and you take V to be diagonal, this is the system that gives you the equation of motion for a rigid body in a Manakov language, according to Manakov's construction. Uh, or if you take U and V to be not in GLN but to be in GLNM and you pick M dimensionals block on it on these structures, then this system gives you uh, a periodic Volterra chain. Uh, Volterra chain is a, a differential difference system, uh, which kind of is a many uh, species version of the normal Volter Lotka Volterra uh, predator prey interaction. Uh, non abelian in the sense that it is relevant whether the k plus one and the k. Um, this could be the number of people of uh, animals in the K plus one uh, population is 
multiplied on the left and the k minus one on the right. So not a billion because of course you get this with this product and uh, Volterra chain because this is this reproduces that the kind of the the, 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 billion, the, the version there. Uh, this system of equation is in fact integrable. Uh, uh, the, the way to see that it is integrable is that it is uh, what, uh, what what in the community we call lax integrability. Namely, if you construct uh, this uh, this object, uh, this uh, well operator, but in fact is a multiplication operator with lambda a formal parameter, uh, then uh, the evolution in time of L is given by this uh, given by this, uh, this this commutator of, of matrices that reproduces this equation and uh, uh, by this equation you have that the traces of powers of l are conserved quantities in, in evolution of the system i mean it's the same case as normal lax integrability for ordinary uh, systems of equation but this is of course is given i mean this l and u are now operators whose entries are metrics so they are not not a billion uh, and uh, what we do, of course, because we like abstraction, is that we forget that originally these U and V were matrices, and uh, we just decide that we are dealing with the function U and V on a space or which uh, where, where the product is not commutative, and we do, it's still associative but not commutative, and uh, we decide that we don't want to know anything about the commutation rule in the space. So it's not like quantum mechanics. This is in principle more general because we don't ask anything about the product of course that you can do kind of reduction to get back there but it's kind of outside the scope of my discussion and as there are system of ODEs in this class there are cases of PDEs where you have the you non know, version of KDV equation uh, the kind of the linear part is of course the same because you cannot really change much on the linear parts but uh, the non the, the nonlinear one gets kind of the democratic split of the position of ux or in the differential difference cases where you have this non-abelian volterra i mean the one that i wrote before in block uh, i can write it as a usual as kind of as a non-only equation for a function of two variables and uh, this is uh, how you write it M more details uh, in about non-abelian of volterra in the parallel session where i will discuss uh, non-abelian different systems in, in, in detail so the point is that, I, I mean, I've claimed that, that uh, I want to see whether a system of this kind is Hamiltonian. And uh, facing uh, the, the question, the matter of what means being a Hamiltonian system here has had uh, in, uh, I would say, kind of in the last maybe 20 or 25 years, uh, uh, a bit of, of a large story. Because uh, uh, historically, I would say that there is kind of operational, but it's just kind of my nickname. Uh, way of discussing it, uh, which is followed, for instance, by Orver and Sokolov. You find different uh, paper by theirs uh, on uh, ODEs systems or PD systems uh, of non-abelian time, and by this it means that they focus on uh, finding properties and characteristics of the uh, operator that defines the equation of motion as a non-abelian Hamiltonian operator, and they are wondering what that means, and they do classification like there. Uh, there is, uh, uh, well, more recently, I would say, an algebraic approach, which I think is very fruitful. And uh, I'm sure that David Fernandez later and Maxime Faron probably tomorrow will spend a big deal of, uh, of talk about this, uh, is the story of double Poisson algebras, uh, introduced by Van der Berg in 2008. And the version that is kind of tailored for uh, PDEs by the Sole, Katz, and Valeri, this is more recent, it's 2013, and what they call the double Poisson vertex algebras. Uh, but of course, uh, what we would like to, 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 to establish, what I'd like to discuss, is kind of a geometric interpretation of what a being Hamiltonian system in the static mean. There are some ideas about it. I would say originally uh, in the Pink Shoes paper from 1993, 1994, albeit, uh, I mean, it is not clear to me as a member of the integrable system community as is this uh, uh, all this discussion relates. To, 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 to equation of motion. And more recently, there are a lecture course by Kiselev, uh, who is called, like, uh, called the non-abelian geometry of uh, differential equation. Uh, this is much more similar in approach, in spirit, to what I'm going to do. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to present a version of it that I think is kind of more appealing to people in the integral system community, and in a way more transparent on its geometric, uh, on its geometric properties. And, uh, the idea is, uh, is as follows. Uh, first of all, we need, uh, as I kind of briefly mentioned, distinguish between the space where fields or where functions live, uh, which is the space A of, uh, 
densities of local functionals and the space of observables of the space of local functionals. And uh, kind of the formal way to see it, of course, according that you're dealing with ODEs, PDs on differential difference equation, the spaces are different, but are always of the form free algebra, quotiented maybe uh, according to uh, the inverse relation if you want to keep into your your Roran polynomial, I mean, if you want to work with Roran polynomials, even if you want to keep into account inverses of your of your function of your matrices, and uh, these are well, these are kind of the version with just generators of the algebra for these. Here you are counting uh, uh, jet variables, and here you're kind of counting shifted variables for dealing with different with different uh, polynomials. But the, the setting in general and in abstract is the same. You have a kind of a quotient of a free algebra on one side, and then uh, the quotient of that space by uh, two operations now, by the uh, commutator of the product there. Basically, that means that your elements are trace of uh, polynomials, of exp or overrun polynomials in the space A. Or, well, fine, if you're working with differential system or different system, on top of the trace, you have to put some kind of integration uh, uh, of the integration operation. I mean, I mean, more details on that to follow. But the idea is that here you have a trace operation, so you have kind of a, a cyclic uh, commutativity of your products of monomials. Here you don't have anything. You have just free algebra pushed by possibly uh, the, the inverse relation. And uh, on this space, uh, okay, let me just uh, work about on ODEs for simplicity, so I forget about difference for, for now. Uh, on this space, I have multiplication operation operators, and these operators, of course, must distinguish whether I multiply on the left and on the right, because the product is not commutative. This is kind of my notation: multiplication of the left, multiplication of the right, and commutators and anti-commutators. Uh, I have uh, what is called a double derivatives. Uh, the formula here is kind of quite nasty looking. Uh, this simply means that uh, uh, you enter with your derivation operator inside a monomial. And if you hit uh, the monomial which corresponds to the, the variable you are taking the, vari the, vari the derivatives for, you split uh, the monomial into bits, one on the left before that, one on the right after that. If what you have hit is a positive power, if what you have it is a negative power, you just use the normal uh, kind of rule for deriving uh, the inverse of a function. So when you split, you put the inverse of uh, the variables you are splitting, the, one on your side, one on the other. This is kind of nasty looking for people who are not used to it. But the important message is that this, is, this double derivative is in fact a derivation. So it has kind of the standard Leibniz property, which is what I'm looking for. Then, oh, this is a nasty, a nasty, nasty slide where I have to define a lot of weird operation on A tensor A and triple tensor of A, just to make the notation that, I mean, of course, on this A tensor A, which is the space where I land when I take derivatives, I have a structure of inner and outer by module by the normal product uh, uh, on A here with this ordering and this other one, which is kind of switches the ordering of your product. The star basically makes you jump while the normal product keeps you in the same in the same side. And then you have this uh, other uh, operation, which are kind of this uh, product uh, in the A in A tensor A. Uh, and kind of this tau is the switch of factors. And then, of course, you have a map that takes your A tensor A and collapses it into A. Matteo, uh, five minute warning. OK, yeah. Sorry, I must run more than I thought. So, OK, I'm not explaining it all the operation in the double tree. The idea is that uh, Van der Berg introduced the, the double bracket uh, double, uh, in, in this uh, A, tensor A, uh, in this tensor A space, which has a lot of weird properties that I don't really uh, time, I've not really time to discuss. It's important that it's still derivation in the second entry, that there is kind of a weird version of skew-symmetry and the Jacobi identity, uh, which uh, is odd, uh, but tells you that uh, if you take the trace operation them of uh, the multiplication map of elements on A, you get a Lie algebra structure on the space of local functional and kind of a sensible notion of a Hamiltonian vector field. So for all these, that kind of works nicely. Uh, you have that double Poisson algebras define uh, proper in the sense of integrable system people Poisson brackets on the space of local functional. We are very happy about it. And uh, there is a proof that I don't have time to discuss. 
but then uh, we hit uh, uh, well examples period that we're trying to discuss. But then we hit an obstacle, which is uh, double quasi Poisson algebras. Uh, I'm not going to discuss very much about the definition because I'm sure that uh, David and Maxim will do it much better than me. Uh, but the idea is that uh, if your Jacobi identity fails to be satisfied, but it is fails to be satisfied in this very peculiar way, these E of S are the compositions of the identity of your algebra A, which kind of means that since I'm a simple person, I take my algebra A like the one before, so my identity is just one. And uh, having a double Poisson algebra, I've basically landed in this, uh, in this weird, in this weird case. In this weird case that kind of puzzled a lot in the whole system community means the operators that define double Poisson algebras are not, sorry, are not Hamiltonian operators in proper sense. Uh, I mean, geometrically, uh, that means that uh, they don't satisfy uh, the Schouten identity for some bracket with itself, I mean, Schouten bracket of the Poisson vector with itself equals zero, but yet they define a Poisson bracket on the space of local functionals. I mean, I'm sure that people in, in the Poisson geometry, not maybe in the non-commutative case, but in the standard case are kind of aware of it because there is this Cartan form, uh, which kind of is the failing of satisfying the Jacobi identity. But this is what happens in, uh, for quasi Poisson algebra. And what I've tried to do is rephrase these double Poisson algebras and double Poisson quasi and quasi double Poisson algebras in a geometric way. I'm really sorry, uh, I must move most of the discussion to the parallel session where I'm uh, introducing what we call theta formal, but it's kind of a differential rate manifold formal is to deal with Schouten bracket in kind of an operational and easy way. And uh, on this space, there must be kind of a double Schouten bracket and uh, a, an actual Schouten bracket uh, as we are used. Once you have done all this kind of preliminary work, uh, the Hamilton, the operator that defines the double Poisson algebra is a Poisson by vector in this sense. So this is uh, an identity. On the other hand, uh, on ground of Poisson by vectors, a Poisson bracket is defined uh, by the double shorter bracket of P with two local functionals. The Jacobi identity is equivalent to this kind of multi bracket, uh, multi bracket expression. And we know that, I mean, in all the cases, or the standard case, we have P with P equals zero, then, okay, Jacobi identity is true. Uh, the action of A is always given in terms of the action of the Poisson. Uh, by vector on the Hamiltonian. So everything is given in terms of the Poisson by vector. This is kind of going to be uh, our, our main character. But as I told you, uh, the problem is that quasi Poisson doesn't fail to satisfy the Schouten bracket and yet satisfies, and this I think it's kind of new, uh, satisfies this expression for all local functionals. So quasi Poisson is, uh, equi uh, is equivalent or at least, yeah, it should be equivalent, in fact, uh, to what in uh, some uh, in some older paper are called kind of pre-Poisson uh, bracket, pre-Poisson by vectors. But I'm not sure it's a standard. Uh, uh, it's a standard kind of it's a standard uh, language. Uh, but this is indeed equivalent to this uh, for any f, which means that of course the Jacobi identity must be satisfied then because the Jacobi identity is always a triple bracket with it. So whichever you put here, you're going to vanish. And the fact that uh, uh, the, Hamilton, the relation between Poisson brackets and Hamiltonian, the computation of Hamiltonian vector fields is in fact uh, uh, kind of given by two brackets like that, which means uh, to make it a slogan and conclude that uh, our uh, quasi Poisson structure define what we call Hamiltonian structure in integral system, which is kind of confusing and uh, I appreciate that because normally we have been uh, taught for all our lives that Poisson and the Hamiltonian coincide. That's at least what goes on in the system uh, uh, courses, but this is not quite true. Uh, Poisson is stricter than a Hamiltonian. I mean, whenever you buy Hamiltonian, you means your Poisson bracket with that does what, what you want to do. And uh, this is uh, the story for quasi Poisson. So quasi Poisson, it is, gives you a Hamiltonian structure on a local functional because of this uh, of this expression, at least right, it's written in this sense. Now it doesn't really matter whether you are working with ODEs, PDEs, differential difference equation, because this is always kind of the kind of expression where you land. On the other hand, I am not aware, and maybe Maxim knows better, of any 
quasi-Poisson, non-abelian quasi-Poisson structure defined for PDEs, but only in the original differential case. So this is kind of, this exists for ODs, definitely. Uh, this, in principle, might exist, but I have no idea how it looks like for PDEs of differential difference equation. But yet, these expressions are kind of safe, uh, fail, fail safe. And this is what, in integral community, we should really look for when uh, we want to discuss whether you have an, a hierarchy of commuting uh, dense, uh, functional uh, quantities, etc., cetera, et cetera. The question whether there are more general structures where these are satisfied but this not is still completely open. I'm not sure I can answer, but if someone can, I really would really appreciate their data. Perhaps that can happen in the parallel session. Yeah, I think that people are going to be all kind of excited because I say, not coming from Poisson uh, geometry, maybe many things that I found as discoveries are trivial for you and I apologize for that. Okay, this is kind of the slogan of what I kind of planning to do in the parallel session and discussion, but that really depends on interest. Okay. okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Let's let's all give a, a round of applause to Matteo, both uh, uh, using emojis as well. Emoji applause, very well. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, so uh, the, our next speaker is uh, Ilya. So Ilya, I'm going to make you, I'm going to ask you to unmute now and I am going to make you a co-host so you will be able to share yeah, your thanks. screen. Uh, so we can see my screen now, yeah? Yep. Yes. Yeah, it looks very good. <laughs> thanks. OK. so. Uh, Let's just wait uh, a minute uh, yeah. before we start. Sure. Right. Um, just a quick, uh, quick remark. So I'm working on uh, posting the slides and uh, links to the videos from all the previous sessions. They should appear this afternoon on the website. these short little breaks between talks are a good opportunity to stretch. Yeah. Yes, I encourage everyone to do some stretching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think it's a good time and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of today's Eastern Hemisphere session, Ilya Gayou from the University of Birmingham, who will talk about extended duality for collateral pen and regional pen systems. Uh, yeah, I want to thank again uh, Anastasia, Nikita and Beatrice for this event and for opportunity to talk here. So my talk will be about the duality arising in so-called Calogero Penlewe systems, which are already well known for community and for some new Rus and Ars Penlewe systems. This work is a collaboration with Vladimir Rukhtov, so we have a preprint on archive and also work is in progress. So the motivation for our work was the following kind of scheme. So we have a final of systems which are kind of uh, uh, non-autonomous analogs of the integrable systems. Uh, due to Manion and Levin and Alshanyatsky, it's, well, it's already known that the systems is just a deformation of two particle collager module like uh, integrable systems. And uh, this is called Pedalecologer correspondence. For this system, there is a quite obvious generalization for n particle systems. And on the Pedalecologer side, we have some introduced by Takasaki multi particle Pedalecologer systems. And the, uh, uh, the connection between these uh, systems and uh, multi particle in the of systems was given. Two years ago, by uh, Bertola, Kafasa, and Rubtsov, and this uh, correspondence uses uh, poison reduction uh, 
uh, well, uh, the motivation for our work is that for these systems, for the classical and particle integrable systems, we have a dual systems which are quite uh, well known and studied. And uh, our uh, our target was to uh, do the same on the side of the binary equation. So we go from the dual systems in some sense here to the new non-autonomous systems here, which are dual to the multi-particle final system. So I will start my talk with the review of the reduction of the multi-particle system from the different uh, uh, Hamiltonian G spaces. So uh, as an example, I will consider the following uh, uh, phase space. This is T star to GLN, so it's just an uh, GLN cross GLN with the following symplectic form and the group, this group is GLN, obviously, acting on this space by just a diagonal conjugation of the matrices P and Q, which are just an coordinates in each direct, uh, indirect product of GLN. Uh, we know that this space uh, is Hamiltonian G space and the moment map uh, which sends uh, every point of our phase space to the co-algebra to G GLN star uh, is just a commutator of P and Q. So it's in some coagent orbit of the uh, Lie group action. Uh, now to derive some integrable system from this picture, we should take some uh, invariant Hamiltonian. Then since Hamiltonian is invariant, the moment map is the constant of motion and we can do a reduction. We take a simplest a uh, possible Hamiltonian, I guess. This is just a free particle Hamiltonian with the following uh, equations of motions. And we do the following reduction. We consider the extended space. We take our phase space, the uh, tangent bundle to GLN, to the algebra GLN, and we uh, take a direct product with the coagent orbit in GLN and do just a marsden weinstein reduction by the group action. Uh, which acts uh, the same on the phase space and by a joint action on the orbit. And the symplectic form on this space is just a uh, symplectic form we already introduced and the constant Kirill of Surio for the coagent orbit. So generally what we obtain, we obtain that dimension of the reduced phase space is equal to 2n, which is Darboux coordinates, uh, plus we have some some uh, function depends on the dimension of the orbit. Generally, this is dimension of the orbit minus the dimension of the stabilizer for this orbit. What is uh, what are the collodron moser systems? The collodron moser systems may be viewed as the systems uh, which uh, reduce space dimension is equals to uh, which reduce space dimension equals to two n. And how to obtain it? We should choose a non-trivial orbit of the minimal dimension. And these orbits are called Calogero moser space and can be obtained by the following relations. So we take a moment map, our commutator, and it equals to run one matrix plus identity matrix. Generally, it may be, uh, it may be uh, interpreted by the following things. So if we will consider our phase space here, just schematically this up M, and uh, we consider the level set of the moment map. So this is a Calogero Moser space. Then we take any point from this uh, Calogero Moser space and we just follow the orbit of the group action here. And then we get to some point on the same uh, level set, but where the dimension is smaller. So generally, this is a point where our matrix Q from the space, our phase space was just a pair of matrices, P and Q. And we, we get to the point where the Q is diagonal. And then the Hamiltonian we did consider it, we did consider before is just a cal rational Calogero Moser system. On the other hand, we can do the same thing. Uh, we can continue following the orbit, but now we want to diagonalize not Q, but P. And then we also may get to the same Calogero Moser space and obtain another point intersection of our orbit with the level set. And then we will obtain just a free particle system. And it means that uh, at this point, we obtain the Calogero Moser coordinates. And at this point, we obtain action angle variables for the Calogero Moser system. 
So now, what is the Rusinas duality for in, in, in such picture? Uh, the Rusinas duality is the following phenomenon. So we take two Hamiltonians, uh, two free Hamiltonians, phrase P square and phrase Q square, uh, square, which are connected by some kind of Fourier transformation. And then we see that they are written on the same phase space. We can take, again, calogero moser space and do the reduction. And for the first Hamiltonian, we obtain that at the green point, we obtain the rational calogero moser as I explained before. And at the blue point, we obtain the free particle system. But for the second Hamiltonian, we have a different situation. We obtain the free system at green point and the, again, rational calogero moser system at the blue point. So this is kind of duality. So we take two different points from our orbit, which intersect the level set of moment map, and uh, write down two Hamiltonian and do the reduction. So here we obtain that the rational calogero moser system self-dual to itself, because on the other side, we obtain the same system, but written in different coordinates. So it may be formulated in the following way, that we have another flow such that the action angle variables for the calogero moser system also uh, is a calogero moser system. So this subduality, um, occasionally this subduality is the uh, consequence uh, of the fact that our initial phase space M, M, which is just a direct product of the Lie algebras, is symmetric in P and Q. If you will consider a little bit more complicated, case when our phase space is T star to the Lie group, T star to GLN. Uh, so again, we it identify the space with the direct product of our group and Lie algebra. So now we have a pair of matrices, which uh, and one of these matrices is invertible. Uh, then we consider the natural symplectic form on this space. This is canonical symplectic form and the same group action, we can consider again two free particle Hamiltonian, which, which are also connected by the Fourier transformation and from uh, and reducing at this space from this Hamiltonian. At one point, we obtain hyperbolic or trigonometric calogero moser system. And at the other point, we obtain the free particle system. So it's again, action angle variables. And for the other Hamiltonian, we obtain free system at the green point at the calogero moser coordinates. And we obtain the rational Poussinar system at the point which corresponds to action angle variables for the calogero moser system. So now we obtain the duality between trigonometric calogero moser and rational, rational Poussinar system. So we obtain dual system, but not self-dual. This is because our phase space is not symmetric anymore. And we may say that this subduality is not a property of the systems, but this is a property of the phase space generally. So, uh, well, you may say that this Hamiltonian is not the same as this one. Okay, we could take the phrase of G square. We will obtain also kind of roots in our system, but we will have to do some additional canonical transformation transformations to get to this system. So. Now, what we want to do, we want to expand this scheme to the panel of the systems. And uh, to do that, I just need to give a brief introduction to the panel of uh, equations and the Eisenman joint deformations. So uh, uh, generally, uh, we can talk about n hold sphere, but I will talk about only just four uh, punctured sphere as our base curve. And then we consider just a G bundle over this uh, curve. And uh, we consider some holomorphic connection on this punctured sphere uh, with the simple poles at uh, the punctures. Due to the uh, Mobius transformation, I can fix three points, zero, one, and infinity, and one point will be arbitrary. So the space of such holomorphic connections, which uh, have the simple poles at the punctures, may be written as follows. Uh, and we have one deformation parameter T, which lives on the three hold sphere because we don't want to, uh, we don't want punctures to collide. So, what are the isomonodromic deformations? Isomonodromic deformations is 
the same as the consideration of the following connection on the extended phase space when we take the base curve plus uh, cross our uh, space or the deformation space and we just uh, require the flatness of this connection and it will be the same as isomonodromic deformations. So we obtain some uh, equations, some partial differential equations, uh, and they are actually Hamiltonian with the following Hamiltonian. So we should take a square of our connection of the uh, uh, square of our connect connection and take a residue at the uh, uh, point T. So this is Hamiltonian for these equations and the symplectic form is may be given by the well-known idea both symplectic structure on the space of the connections uh, with the action of the gauge group. And due to Hitch in this, uh, in this situation, we may just consider that our residues of our connection just lives in the coagent, in, in the direct product of the coagent orbits. The symplectic form is given by the constant Kirill of Surya on this direct product, and the gauge group action just the diagonal adjoint action on this space. And the moment map is just the sum of the residues, which is quite a um, natural moment map. And this relation may be obtained from the fact that the sum of residues equals to zero. So, what are the Pandora equations? So, I will just introduce. The Pandora 6 equation. So the Pandora 6 equation, the 6 Pandora equation is just a deformation equations for SL2 connection over four punctured Riemann sphere. And these equations can be obtained uh, by the uh, Marsden Weinstein reduction uh, with respect to the moment map I did introduce before. Plus, we need to resolve some Casimirs. And the thing is that uh, in this situation, we obtain that the Pandora equation may be formulated as some Hamiltonian systems with the rational Hamiltonian and the uh, Darbu, uh, written in the Darbu coordinate. Uh, this rational Hamiltonian, they are rational in E and Q, they are quite big and wild. And uh, the natural form, the physical form uh, we want to obtain here is just an kinetic part, which is P square plus, plus some potential, which depends only on the coordinate Q and maybe on the time. So due to Mannion, the Pandora 6 equation may be now written as a natural Hamiltonian, but not on the previous phase space, but on the elliptic curve, because our potential here is Gerstra's elliptic function. And the time, since we obtained the non-autonomous Hamiltonian system. The time is just a different uh, is a modulus of elliptic curve. So we may view the panel of six equation as a deformation of model of elliptic curve and some uh, some Hamiltonian system on that. And if we will do the autonomization of this uh, system, we will obtain two particle in system in a of systems. It was obtained by Levin and Olshanetsky and this is kind of the main statement of the Pandora Calogera correspondence that the Pandora equation may be written as the deformation of the inosemptive system. So Pandora 6 corresponds to elliptic one, Pandora 5 corresponds to trigonometric one, and Pandora 4 corresponds to the rational one. And other Pandora equations are some different degenerations of this system. So, it works for all Pandora equations, so we can write them into the following form. And the main question is how to obtain multiparticle systems. So to obtain multiparticle multiparticle systems, we need to consider now not SL2 bundle over four-hole sphere, but now we consider GL2N uh, bundle with the same uh, with the same moduli space of connections. And now uh, we know that. AI may be interpreted as the elements of the uh, coagent orbits. And to obtain multi-particle system, we put AI to a very special orbit, the orbit which may be written as a tensor product of SL2 with some, the, uh, with some orbit of the smaller dimension. Due to Kawakami, in this situation, deformation equations may be written 
as the Hamiltonian systems on T star to GLN with the Hamiltonians, which can be written as traces of some polynomials in Q, P, Q minus one and T. These systems are called matrix band of equations. They can be generalized for all P type equations. So not only for P6, but also for P5, P4 and so on. And as you can see, these Hamiltonians are invariants of the adjoint action of a group. That means that we can do a reduction for this Hamiltonians and the very, and the, I think, uh, beautiful result by uh, Bertolo Cafas and Rubtsov was that the symplectic reduction of these systems gives us n particle panel of ecological uh, systems. So they build this uh, pass from some matrix panel of equation to multiparticle panel of ecological systems. On the other hand, we can consider the dual systems reducing from the other point of the orbit, from the other intersection of our orbit with the Calogero Moser space. And actually, we will obtain some new unknown systems which are dual to the panel of Calogero systems. The main question here is how to obtain isomonodromic form for reduced systems, which can be reformulated in the following form how to lift reduction to the connections. The answer is the gauge transformation. Since we consider our residue to live in this phase space, so we take some coagent orbit and uh, multiply it by SO2, our connection lives in the following space. So we have our phase space, which is T star to G actually, tensor product to SO2 and turns the product to the holomorphic forms on the four punctured sphere. And we take very special gauge here. It's just a tensor product of some matrix with the identity matrix on, uh, with the identity matrix of the uh, size two. So you can see that it acts as, at, uh, so, and also this gauge is a constant. So we don't have the affine part for the gauge transformation. So it's purely conjugation of our connection. So as you can see, the form of the gauge uh, means that we do uh, we act on our phase space as an adjoint action of G, and we act trivially on the SL2. So doing the reduction from the point of view of symplectic reduction, we obtain two different Hamiltonians, reduced one and the dual one. To each of these Hamiltonians, we have different gauges reduced one and dual one also. And the connection which we obtain after the gauge transformation has a, has a following form. So you can see that they are just a, a joint. Uh, so they are just conjugated to the initial connection. So they conjugated to itself. This means that we have the same spectral invariance for these two systems because uh, spectral curve is gauge invariant. And that's why we call this duality, is a spectral duality for these two systems. So now, uh, when we were talking about the Rusinov's duality for the classical systems, we were talking about the action angle dualities. Here, the situation a little bit different because we have the action-action duality because the spectral curve, in a sense, we have a non-autonomous systems, but in a sense, spectral curve fix, out, uh, fix some uh, action variables. And here we have that we have non-trivial uh, identities between the action variables for reduced system and for dual one. Uh, finally, I want to give you an example, probably our most fresh example, which, uh, re uh, which use the roots in our systems. Uh, here it is Pandavis re-equation of type D, D8. So the Hamiltonian written in the following form, you can see that we have the inverse of the Q matrix. So the natural space for this Hamiltonian is just a space such that the determinant of Q is not zero. And uh, occasionally this space is just simple automorphic to T star to GLM. And using this transformation, which gives us this symplectomorphism plus some transformations, we send this Hamiltonian to the following one. 
And you can see that here we have combination of two uh, Hamiltonians we, we considered before. We have a collagen water part, which is P squared, and we have the Roussinard's part, with, which is G plus G minus one. So the reduced system is just an uh, trigonometric final of a collagen system. You can see that we have a diagonal part here, and also we have the potential, which is hyperbolic in the QI and QG, this is uh, interaction potential. The dual system takes another form, so we have still have this um, diagonal part, plus we have some uh, part which is just a Roussinard system, which uh, is multiplied by some non-autonomous function, which is exponent of time. So in a sense, in this example, we see that the final of a Roussinard system, they combine uh, together Calogero Moser one and Rusna system, and these two systems and their autonomous, uh, autonomous version were not known before. So, and again, the great thing about this stuff that we have a very different lax operators for these two systems, but we have the same spectral curves and spectral invariants. Um, yeah, you have about three minutes left. Uh, yes, I already finished. So oh, thank you for attention. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, I can give some more details on the reduction and uh, our plans during the discussion. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Let's uh, let's let us all give a round of applause to Ilya, including emoji emoji round of applause. Well done. Thank you very much for this talk. Wonderful. So uh, let's uh, so let's move on to our last speaker, uh, David Fernandez. Uh, so David, I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute yourself, and um, I will make you a co-host, so you will Perfect. be able to share your slides now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So I remind everyone that uh, we're also running Slack, Slack, uh, uh, Slack channel, Slack workspace alongside our conference, and uh, people are asking questions on Slack. Um, so it's a, it's a really good place to uh, uh, leave comments or questions about particular talks. Yeah, are you seeing my my screen? Yes, we can yes. see it very well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So uh, I guess we're, we're slightly ahead of schedule, um, but uh, I suppose we could start a little bit sooner. Um, I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Nastya? Or should we uh, wait? A few minutes until... sooner. Yeah, just in yeah. case that uh, anybody is connecting specifically to David's talk, maybe. Yeah. Two minutes I... sooner, yeah. But... Yeah, yeah, I would say not. Uh... We still can use this time to stretch, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Stretch, stand up. Move away from your screen. Oh, Two-minute yoga. That's right, okay. Eva. <laughs> Eva, would you like to lead a two-minute yoga session? Not me. <laughs> oh, okay. So she's suggesting, Nesta, that you... Uh, always, you be... always. The sky, yes. Maybe I'll also... No, no, that. here's... He's lying down, he's, he's asleep. Hello. Hello. Nikita keeps his dog in a drawer. Yeah, that's right, I keep my dog in a drawer. <laughs> I, have a, I have a specific shelf and uh, that's where I keep my dog. <laughs> right, baby? <laughs> okay, go back to sleep. Okay, yeah, the name. <laughs> okay, probably we can we can start introducing. Uh, well, it's. I mean, so we should. Uh, no, I think we should wait until. Uh, okay, a few more minutes. 
yeah yeah just because some people might want to tune in specifically for the talk we don't want to start ahead of schedule okay well then i assume it's bring your pet to work kind of break i think that's a good idea <laughs> right a bit of disruption Okay, so a chair dog of this session will be Sky. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Two files called uh, final make me slightly nervous. To file, final, <laughs> right? <laughs> which one is the more final, David? Which which one of the two is the more final? Uh, uh, I think that the the parallel one. Okay. Oh parallel. no, because one of the, the one of them parallel. Is yeah, yeah. It yes, is, yes, yeah. there are two two archives. Yeah. But you now, no, you have a lot of versions of of the same document, and finally you have the final one, and the then the final final and final final oh. final final. Yeah. <laughs> That was the story of my PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too, me too. But you are seeing my 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 slide, no? Right now. No, no, we see. No, we, we see. see your... We see your uh, uh, find oh. the window. Oh. oh, oh. oh, oh. Eh. And now? No. Uh, no. Not yet. No, I think you need to. So maybe stop sharing and and uh, choose okay. share okay. again and uh, select ah. specifically your. Oh, okay, video. okay, okay. One, one minute. Uh, Most likely, when you chose sharing the um, uh, your desktop, yeah, yeah. you choose particular Finder app. Oui. But, yeah. Ah, no. Okay. No? There we go. Yeah, yes. perfect. Now we can see perfect. it. Perfect, perfect. Sorry, I, I no was problem. confident that, no, no. that just, just on time. You, you are seeing my slides also. Okay, okay. No problem. Just on time. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so let's just okay, wait so. uh, half half a minute more and then and then we can introduce David. Okay, and our uh, last speaker for today's Eastern European, uh, sorry, Eastern Hemisphere session is David Fernandez from Belfield University, who will talk about non commutative Poisson geometry and pre Calabi-Yau algebras. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the great opportunity to speak here. Uh, thank you to the organizers for, for this uh, wonderful uh, conference. Uh, today, in this talk, the goal of my talk today will be. Will, uh, I will present the deep and interesting relationship between pre algebras and non commutative Poisson structures. This is a joint work with Stanislao Herskovic uh, at Grenoble, and this talk will be based on our two articles. The first one is uh, from uh, uh, 2019, Cyclic Infinite Algebras and Double Poisson Algebras, and the second one of this year is uh, Double Quasi Poisson Algebras are pre -Calabia. So um, the starting point of, 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 of this talk is that defining interesting non commutative Poisson, Poisson structures on an associative uh, algebra A is tricky because if you try to copy the, the usual definition, 
uh, you will obtain only a multiple of the commutator, and this is not very, very interesting. So Vandenberg in 2008, as uh, Matteo remarked in, in his talk, introduced double brackets on associative algebras, which are collinear maps from A tensor A to A tensor A, satisfying two properties, this anti-symmetry and this uh, Leibniz uh, rule. But uh, to define double Poisson brackets, we will need a Jacobi identity. So we will define this extended uh, double brackets in this uh, usual way. And Vandenberg defined a double Poisson algebra on an, associ an associative algebra A as a double bracket, such that this uh, special Jacobi identity called double Jacobi identity holds, okay? Where some permutation appears and this identity takes place in A cubic. Um, also Vandenberg defined in, in his article a non commutative analog of classical quasi Poisson manifolds. They are, uh, which are double quasi Poisson algebras. A double quasi Poisson bracket on, on an associative algebra A is a double bracket from A tensor A to A tensor A, satisfying this modified double Jacobi identity because note that is not non homogeneous because on the right hand side we, uh, we have these eight beautiful pink uh, terms, okay, on the uh, right hand side. And this is the notion of a double quasi Poisson bracket. Um, infinite algebras, as introduced by Stasev in 1963, also called strongly homotopy associative algebras, recall that they are non associative algebras, but the failure in their associative law is controlled. They are associative up to homotopy. They are controlled by higher multiplications. More precisely, a non-unital infinite algebra is a graded vector space, let's say B, endowed with graded maps, Mn of degree two minus N, satisfying these bunch of identities. They are called Stasev identities, where the sum runs over all these decompositions of N in R, S, and T. Okay, and well, this is a, a bunch of equations and little by little you, ca you can decode, decode them and you obtain uh, interesting things. Okay, but in particular, we, in this talk, we will be interested on some special class of, of infinite algebras, which are called uh, cyclic infinite algebras. Given an integer, an infinite algebra B is called decyclic, if it carries a non-degenerate by linear form, gamma, of degree D, such that these two natural conditions um, hold, no? this symmetry and this uh, cyclicity using the multiplications, the higher multiplications, okay? Um, but um, in a manuscript, uh, Konsevich and Blasopoulos, uh, Blasopoulos introduced pre calabilla algebras. Uh, they were introduced because uh, compact calabilla algebras, the, the usual uh, notion of, of calabilla algebras, were too restrictive for application related to path spaces, Fukaya categories, open, open pre calabilla manifolds, or Fano manifolds. In fact, these objects or similar ones appear in other settings with other names, and well, you can you can see an overview in in the introduction of, of our article, okay? But uh, let, me, let me define what, uh, what pre calabiao algebras are. Now let me fix D, an integer. A will be a graded associative algebra uh, with, with, with unit or maybe locally finite dimensional. Um, a, a star will be the dual with respect to the field of, of zero characteristic. T will be the suspension morphism. And we introduce this special, this, this very important, this will be key, uh, a key object in our talk, will be this partial DA, which is the sum of A and uh, A star shifted, A star shifted by D, okay? And well, this partial DA know that it has very nice properties because uh, using the square zero, zero extension, which is uh, explained here in the, in the second point, this is a graded algebra, okay? This is a, 
uh, graded algebra. And in fact, uh, we can define a natural bilinear form, uh, this gamma, from this partial dA to k, yeah, which is uh, basically the evaluation when we have an element of a and an element of a star, and we, we have two elements of a or two elements in a star, is zero. Okay? So following Konsevich and Blasopoulos, we given d an integer, we define a d pre algebra on an associative, on a graded associative algebra A as the datum of a d minus one cyclic infinite algebra on this partial d minus d minus one A for this natural bilinear for gamma, of, which is of degree uh, d minus one, such that we ask that the higher multiplications of, of this uh, infinite algebra um, map A tensor N into A, okay? It's contained, the image is contained in A for all, an uh, for all uh, na natural numbers. A zero pre o algebra will be simply called a pre o algebra, okay? So we have this, uh, this key notion. I, I, I've just uh, given the, uh, let's say, the operative definition. This is the, the, the easiest definition to deal with. But there exists another alternative perspective, which is very, very interesting. And it was developed by Young in, in, in 2018 and Natalie Yudu and Maxim Konsevich in 2019. They uh, state that a pre algebra is a non commutative analog of a solution to the Marer Cartar equation for the uh, classical, for the, well, for the natural, Southern E and Huis bracket on polyvector fields. Okay? So, uh, this is, uh, in other words, we can say that a pre algebra can be regarded as a formal non commutative Poisson structure. Okay? So, so far, we have. On one hand, we have Vandenberg's double uh, Poisson algebras, which are, uh, in, in, in some sense, they are natural non commutative Poisson structures. And on the other hand, by, by this uh, alternative perspective, uh, we have that pre algebras also are non commutative Poisson structures, but in the setting of uh, formal uh, geometry. So, a natural question, in my opinion, is try to find or try to determine if we can find a relationship, a link between these two objects, between Vandenberg's double Poisson algebras and pre algebras, okay? And, uh, and if there is any, and the answer is that, uh, yes, we have a relationship, and this is this remarkable theorem by Natalia Yudo and Konsevich, who says, uh, that says that if A is an associative algebra, we consider now the natural algebra structure uh, that we discussed before on partial minus one A, as well as its natural bilinear form that we saw before. Now we assume that uh, this uh, associative algebra A is endowed with a pre structure uh, with higher multiplications, but note that we only are interested on M2 and M3, okay? We only have M2 and M3. And in fact, well, M2 coincides with the natural multiplication on, on this object here. Finally, we define this map from A tensor A to A tensor A by a, this way, okay? Using M3. And well, it's, it's a very natural definition four elements, uh, two elements in A and two elements in A star. Then they prove that with this definition, this map, the, this map is a double Poisson bracket on A, okay? Let me, let me note, let me remark that they further require that uh, when, when you evaluate M3, when, when you have two elements uh, together of A or two elements together in A star, 
and you evaluate M3, this is zero, and this is called the nice property. Okay, this is a, a, well, a technical condition, but it will be uh, very, very important. And in fact, if you don't conceive it's proof that there exists uh, one to one correspondence between these nice precalabial structures and double Poisson adjuncts. Okay, and the, the, the proof appears in this paper uh, here. Now, uh, our uh, we want to extend this result to the differential graded setting, if, if it is possible. And in fact, it is possible. And this is the first main result of this talk. Let me fix as usual D and an integer number and let A be a differential graded algebra. Okay, this is very important. A will be a differential graded algebra. Take now the natural structure of, of differential graded algebra on this space. Okay, uh, the, the uh, partial D minus one A, as well as is natural bilinear form, which is of uh, degree D minus one. Now, let me consider a D precalabillao structure whose higher multiplication will be denoted uh, by this way using uh, M, such that we are only, we have only M1. M2 and M3, okay? And the rest are zero. I'm, 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 I'm focusing on M1, M2, and M3. And in fact, let me assume that this M2 coincides with the natural multiplication in this space. And because this space is naturally a, a, a differential graded algebra, because A was a DG algebra, then uh, then uh, I, I, I will assume that M1 uh, coincides with the natural differential, differential on this space. And finally, we define this map from A tensor A to A tensor A by this way, okay, which is very similar to the, to the, to the previous definition. And this will be a sign that I will say something uh, later. Okay, but this is a sign, and we have two elements of uh, of a b of a and two elements of a star, and we combine in this natural way. Okay, M three is taking in, in altern uh, is taking alternative arguments. That's the that's the idea. Then first we prove that with this definition. This is a double Poisson, double Poisson bracket of degree minus D on this differential graded algebra A. And in fact, the map where this, uh, which sends a nice D precalabillao structures where only have multiplications M1, M2, M3, and it, it, this is mapped to double, double Poisson, uh, Poisson brackets on A of degree minus D, given by sending M3 to the double Poisson, double Poisson bracket determined by, by this formula, by this very explicit formula, is a by X. Okay, so we have this, this extension, this natural extension to the differential real setting of, of the previous result. Uh, let me say that uh, the, the, uh, this, this sign, uh, this is a sign and is explicitly given by this way. Signs in this story are important, but well, no, I'm, I'm not going to stress that. But, and the idea, the idea of the proof is that uh, the fact that the, the double, passing, double Poisson bracket is closed is equivalent to the third Stasev identity on this space. In fact, the Leibniz identity is equivalent to SI4, the, the fourth Stasev identity, and the double, Jacob the double Jacobi identity is equivalent to SI5, okay? And the rest of, of Stasev identities are uh, vanishing because we are taking only M1, M2, um, M3, okay? And also in this article, uh, we also saw that this correspondence satisfies an interesting factorial property. We introduce the notion of a map of the Calabillao algebras. And uh, we also have an extension of the theorem relating uh, double p-infinite algebras 
uh, and certain precalabria wilderness. Okay, and this I will explain that in the parallel session. Okay, if you if you are interested. Okay, so let me go to the to the final uh, section. Uh, the question, uh, the motivating question is the following. Can we find a relationship between precalabria algebras and the inverse uh, double quasi Poisson brackets on associative algebras? Uh, let me recall, this is the, the second slide of my talk, recall, recall that the modified double Jacob identity was, uh, was that we have uh, these uh, brackets, uh, these double brackets, and on the right hand side, we have these eight terms, these eight terms, uh, these pink eight terms, okay? Of course, I know that uh, three over uh, 12 is uh, one over four, but let me, uh, let me keep it in this way because one over 12 will be a, a, a very interesting number as, as we'll see, okay? So now, uh, given arbitrary F, G and H uh, elements in A star, if we apply uh, this object to the previous expression, to this modified double Jacobi identity, I obtain this uh, nice identity where the left-hand side is in blue and the right-hand side is in orange, okay? So, uh, as I said in the, in the previous slide, uh, the key, maybe the key point of the, of the previous theorem, uh, which relates double Poisson algebra, recall double Poisson algebras and precalabria structures with M2 and M3, well, this is the theorem by Yudo and Konsevich, um, states that the double Jacobi identity is equivalent to the fifth Stasev identity, okay? And this uh, sentence uh, translates on the, into this identity. This, uh, the left-hand side of this identity is precisely this, uh, this uh, green, uh, uh, these three terms, which are obtained, the, are uh, as, uh, this, this, the fifth Stasev identity when I only have M2 and M3. Okay, so so far we have the left hand side of this identity. So the idea or idea was well, maybe. We shall recover this modified Jacobi identity, this non homogeneous Jacobi identity from the fifth Stasev identity uh, by considering uh, M2, M3, and, and this is the key point of the whole story, and M4. Okay? In other words, we shall, opt we shall obtain the orange terms in the modified double Jacobi identity from an appropriate M4. Of course, if you add M4, the, uh, the fifth Stasev identity gets uh, more complicated. And in fact, it uh, transforms into this identity here, okay? Where we have these green identities that we saw them uh, here, okay? But now we have these six uh, new terms at the uh, right-hand side of, of my identity, okay? So uh, we try to, to work out this idea and by choosing uh, appropriate M4. And well, we, we work a lot uh, by guessing what are the appropriate M4 needed, no? And, and, and finally, we got this nice identity, this uh, nice uh, M4, okay, which, ha which have these these very explicit and beautiful um, expressions and know that we have here the one over 12. And that's the reason why is, it was very important uh, to keep the, this number. And uh, plugging these expressions at the right, right hand side of this identity, we obtain that precisely these new six red terms here in the right uh, hand side are exactly exactly the eight terms of the modified double Jacobi identity that defines a double quasi Poisson bracket. So this, this was uh, perfect and it was a, a very, very intense moment, a very happy moment. 
And in fact, we prove that the fifth, uh, uh, the fifth stasif identity holds for these choices of M2, M3, and M4. Okay. Um, but well, you have to prove the rest of stasif identities, but because you have only a finite number of, of multiplications, well, you only have to, to check a finite number of, of stasif identities. In particular, you have to uh, check uh, the, the seventh uh, stasif identity. Uh, and the problem is that with the average uh, choice of M2, M3, and M4, the seventh stasif identity doesn't hold. Okay, so well, uh, we, we have to, to work a little bit more. So the idea was, well, let's, let's add an appropriate M6 and, well, uh, adding this MC, M6, M6, we uh, finally prove that the, the seventh stasif identity holds for these choices of M2, M3, M4, and M6. So, perfect. But again, we have to uh, check the rest of stasif identities, and in particular, uh, SSEI. 11. And again, the problem is that, that SI11 doesn't hold. So you can add an appropriate MI8 and, well, you can imagine how the story uh, goes on. Okay, so maybe we can uh, compare this situation or we can establish a kind of metaphor with uh, this, uh, the castle by this conceptual uh, Mexican artist, uh, Jorge Mendez Blake. Uh, note that we want to keep track the modified non -mo homogeneous double Jacobi identity, the book at the bottom, the book is, is Frank, Kafka, Kafka, Frank Kafka's uh, The Castle, by adding higher multiplications, which uh, will be the layers of bricks. But at the end, at the end, note that we always have this bump here at, at, at the top. Okay? So, Mm, and, and you can add more and more uh, layers of bricks, more and more higher multiplication, but the, uh, the, the, the bump will be uh, still there. So the idea was to add an infinite number of layers to our world. That is, we have to add an infinite number of higher multiplications, okay? And this is the, 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 the theorem, our, our second theorem. And this is the main result of this article, uh, the, the, the second article. Let me, uh, A will be an associative algebra carrying a double quasi Poisson bracket. Uh, in particular, uh, it satisfies this modified uh, double uh, Jacobi identity. So, um, now let me, we consider a partial minus one A, which will be the, uh, the sum of A plus A star uh, minus one. That is, uh, we shifted A star provided with its uh, usual multiplication and the natural bilinear form gamma as well. Uh, okay. Now we consider, we, we have to consider the, the precalabillao structures. We have M3 and we will define M, uh, M3 uh, in this way, okay? Using the double quasi Poisson bracket, we define this M3, okay? So, so far we have M2, which is the multiplication, and M3 given by this explicit formula, which is basically Concevich, you do Concevich formula. Furthermore, for i uh, less than, than j, and we decompose n as i uh, plus j plus one, um, uh, we define mn in this way. Uh, let me remark that, uh, uh, yes, uh, we define MN in this way, okay? Where note that we are only considering uh, even multiplications, okay? We are, consider, uh, we are considering M4, M6, and so on, 
Okay, so, so far we have the double quasi-Poisson bracket and then we will uh, define, the, uh, we have the uh, M2 multiplication, the M3 multiplication and the even multiplications. And in fact, all this story that I explained before that we, we, we work with M4, M6, M8 and so on, allows us to guess what, uh, what should be the explicit form for these higher multiplications. And, and, and this higher multiplication is defined in this way, okay? Which is uh, a very beautiful uh, and very explicit uh, formula. And the idea is that uh, uh, you- so David, uh, David we're, uh, we're basically out of time, but maybe you can just finish this last thought and then- uh, uh, Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Ah, sorry, I, 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 th I thought that I was on time. Sorry, sorry. No problem, no yes. problem. Uh, uh, in one minute, only one minute, uh, okay. sorry. Uh, we have the, the, e, the EMN and we define in this way very explicitly and we, we have this CIG, which will be a const constant. Then A is a strictly unitary infinite algebra. And in fact, it defines a structure of a pre algebra. So from double quasi poisson brackets, we obtain uh, pre algebras. Let me remark that this, uh, these identities, these uh, constants are, uh, are explicitly given by this way and where these Bernoulli numbers appear. And as you see, well, they are very, very difficult uh, constants to deal with. And in fact, finally, the, the, the theorem um, will um, is 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 uh, reduced or is uh, translated into a quadratic uh, recursive quadratic system on these constants. And fortunately, uh, we found uh, uh, an, uh, an identity proved by Buis Carrasquelvera Murillo in the setting of Lorentz Sullivan G algebras, which allows us to prove this uh, recursive and quadratic system. Okay, that's. That's the, that's the thing. So, so thank okay. you so, uh, so much for your attention and sorry for. for, for thank you very much. Thank you. Let's thank give uh, David a round of applause, including emoji applause. <laughs> Don't forget the emoji applause. Yes, very good. All right. So, thank you, David. So, that was the last talk of our uh, plenary session uh, today, uh, the first plenary session of today. Uh, now, all the four speakers. Um, are going to be split into parallel session rooms. So I just want to remind that uh, uh, Marine um, and Philip are going to be in room one. Uh, Mateo is going to be in room two. Ilya in room three, and David in room four. So all of the, the, links, that... the links to the rooms can be found in the conference package. Yes. Okay, so take take a couple of, especially let the speakers take a few minutes rest, um, and then uh, and then continue. So we'll see you in one of the one of the parallel session rooms. Okay. Jan. What's going on? Oh, okay. Sorry, I was looking for the bubble actually. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay. No, no problem then.